Uh, hey everyone, uh, it's two o'clock, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get started with uh, this presentation. So hi everyone, um, my name is Richard Smith, I'm presenting on enriching your SOC investigations with insights from Active Directory. If you're not here for this, yeah, the rooms are that way. Um, but I think we're halfway through the day, so I think we're all pretty much pretty much where we're supposed to be by now. So that's good. Cool. All right. So, hey, we're on then. It's fine. Hello. Uh, my name is Richard Smith. I am a security operations center consultant and now uh, engineer in uh, defensive cybersecurity engineering, uh, working at Security Risk Advisors, um, uh, also known as SRA. Uh, SRA is a consultancy firm uh, headquartered in Philadelphia. We have an office in Rochester, New York as well. Um, we work mainly with Fortune 100 clients, uh, large you know, uh, companies like that. And so uh, I've been uh, focusing on uh, both defending and engineering detections and uh, doing all kinds of defensive work uh, for, for those clients for the past uh, nearly three years now. Uh, I've got 13 years experience total in the IT field, uh, going from systems and network engineering through you know, uh, being a VMware consultant. Uh, so I, I've, I've had some, some experience of working with Active Directory in a number of different contexts and industries over the years. And um, I'm <laughs> it's right at the bottom, so it's kind of hard to see, but you can find me on Mastodon. I do have a Mastodon handle. It's um, yeah, I don't know how I pronounce that. Do I? I think I pronounce it Shibathas, which is just a random string of letters that made sense to me at the time when I was going from a Mastodon account. If you want to, uh, if you want to re reach out to me, you can reach out to me on Mastodon through that. Um, uh, so yeah, certainly, um, if you have any questions that I haven't addressed today, um, you can contact me through Mastodon. Uh, so first off, why? Um, uh, why this topic? Um, well, uh, as, a, as a SOC analyst, I have I realized that a lot of my uh, fellow SOC analysts um, aren't really all that familiar with uh, how AD works or uh, how AD can be useful in their security investigations. Um, and I realized uh, after a few months of working as a defender in the SOC that my experience as a sysadmin and a systems and network engineer gave me uh, some really uh, advantageous expertise and knowledge, and that uh, enabled me to, to pass on some insights to my coworkers, and um, I'm now passing some of that on to you as well, uh, because as you'll see, uh, that expertise, it's not necessarily something people think of as their first, uh, the first sort of line of, uh, of things that people want to uh, study when they when they're getting into defensive cyber security, but it is vitally important. Uh, so, um, apologies to anyone for whom this is way too basic, um, but let's let's start with uh, just a brief introduction to what exactly Active Directory is and what it's for. So, uh, Active Directory is, uh, well, fully Active Directory domain services is Microsoft's um, uh, Jeez, I can't read this light. Ooh. It's Microsoft system for uh, hierarchical storage of data relating to network objects. So that could be anything from users, groups, computers, uh, policy objects, um, any any of the any of the objects, any of the items that you would find in in a in an enterprise or a small business network. Uh, that this is how Microsoft stores all that data and. Uh, presents it for use. Um, practically all businesses that run Microsoft Windows architecture are using some version of Active Directory, whether it's on-premises or in the cloud using Azure uh, or some kind of hybrid of the two. Uh, most businesses are using it, so it is, it is a highly, uh, you know, widely used uh, technology stack. Uh, it's highly scalable, so Active Directory can replicate the it, it can replicate schemas across um, local, you know, within within one office, within a multi-campus office, within a town. It can replicate across national or global infrastructures as well. It's um, it's 
usable by you know, anything from small businesses to multinational conglomerates. Uh, and the same tool set and architecture is, is therefore used by anything from a small business to um, you know, a multinational corporation. Um, so yeah, it is, it is highly scalable and very widely used. Uh, why does it matter for security professionals? Well, um, no, hang on. I apologize, I have skipped it. I have skipped it there. So, um, it's in the cloud. We have Azure Active Directory as well as on-prem. Um, I am mainly focusing on on-prem Active Directory in this talk, um, simply because um, my, my experience with Active Directory has mainly been with on-prem. I'm, I'm, I, I am starting to get more experience with Azure AD, but I would rather, uh, rather give you knowledge that I know something about rather than you know, <laughs> trying to talk about things that I have experience with. Uh, it's, that way lies madness. Um, so, yeah. And why does it matter? Okay. Why does it matter to InfoSec professionals? Well, Active Directory stores an absolute ton of metadata about a given domain, network, computer, group. Yeah, there's just a ton of metadata that is stored in that, which is really useful uh, for uh, both attackers and defenders. Um, it's highly sought after by attackers. And it's really useful to us because it gives us the ability to enrich uh, SOC investigations because of just the sheer amount of data that one can pull out of Active Directory objects. Um, and I'm just going to show you briefly, this is just a quick video just of me going through a lab environment and uh, showing just the sheer plethora of data that uh, one can get about an object. Uh, by looking it up in Active Directory. So here I am going into Active Directory. Uh, I think I first go to the user object, Richard Smith. Not sure I trust him. Uh, okay, yeah. So we see all, all this is all, most of this at least is manually inputted data, but here you can see created and modified data for the account. You can see permissions that the account has, security settings, group memberships, all kinds of things. Um, and this is a group object. And there's a ton of attributes you can see in there as well. And lastly, some information on a computer object, again, from my lab environment. Okay. Well, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So there you go. So that that is, just broadly speaking, that's what Active Directory is, and that's what you can what you can do with it from a business perspective. So uh, let's have a look at some useful Active Directory fields from our perspective as InfoSec professionals. So. Um, there's different types of users, uh, different types of user account objects, I should say, um, in Active Directory. So there are just regular user accounts, like you would find for an actual human user who's logging into an environment. Uh, you also find group objects, which are in two different kinds. There's security groups, which are associated with you know, permissions to, to do certain activities in the environment, um, and distribution groups, which are Broadly for you know creating an email list, etc. And there are also built-in users. Um, this is probably something really that, that you need to know as a as an infosec professional. We want to know a bit about the built-in users because those are the ones uh, that are probably more likely to to try and get leveraged by an attacker because a lot of the built-in users are the ones with like root-level permissions. Actually. Um, you also would find exchange objects often. Uh, if you're using on-prem exchange at least with an active directory. So you have mailboxes um, which are uh, often they're tied into a user account and you'll find them within the user account object. Um, you'll also find resource objects for exchange in active directory. That would be, well the way it looks is that it's a user account uh, that is built purely just to serve as a placeholder for an exchange resource such as a room or a shared mailbox 
objects like that. It's not actually an account that gets logged into. <coughs> and then um, uh, when you when you look into um, uh, an AV object just within the, the, the usual Active Directory users and computers tool that I just showed, um, you don't necessarily see all the uh, all the attributes of that object um, straight away. So uh, you want to go into uh, Attribute Editor to see the full uh, list, the, the full like you know, list of fields and attributes that an object has. Uh, some of them are kind of hidden away, and that and you, when you look in at sorry, when you look in Attribute Editor, you'll see the full list of, of fields, and you'll see stuff that maybe you wouldn't have known about if you just looked it up using the regular tool set. Um, Attribute Editor is a it's a tab that's usually available in Active Directory um, AD ADUC, which is the old GUI, and ADAC, which is which is the, the newer version of the same tool, the later editions of Windows Server. And you can find it yeah, on Windows Server 2016 or later. Uh, you can also download um, you can also download these tools uh, for Windows workstations uh, via the RSAT package, the Remote Server Administration Tools package, which is usually available as a Windows feature in most distributions of Windows. Uh, here I am demonstrating the attribute editor. So this is the editor on a user object, and you can just see just a sheer number of attributes and fields that are in there. Uh, which um, which aren't typically shown when you just go into a regular uh, profile, but you know it's uh, it's all in there and uh, it, it's all available when you know how to look. Um, okay, so command line tools uh, probably most of the, uh, the the best and newest features. Um, the most useful new features, I should say, uh, for Active Directory research are available in the in the command line. Um, whether it's in PowerShell or in you know old command line tools. So, just going going back, you know, a long time, uh, for a while, uh, the the net command has been available, um, you know, really since forever, right? Um, and that that command is used. You can. You can go into the command line and you can query for net computer or net user or net group. Um, and that will allow you to add or modify or even just to to, uh, to view uh, attributes of a computer, a user, uh, or a group. So you can use that as a, as a query to get you know, more information uh, on a user if, if, you, if you need to, for instance. Um, so yes, as a screenshot, here I am running the net user command on Richard Smith in my lab. And you can see all kinds of information just comes up by default on, on the output of this command. So you can see you can see the name, you can see whether the account's active, you can see when it expires, if ever. You can see when the password was last set. Um, that's, that's really useful when you're uh, investigating Certain activity um, through through your sim, uh, last logon, etc., uh, etc. Et um, in addition, sorry, in addition to the uh, the command line tools that have been around really for a long time, some of the newer features and tools that you can use to make Active Directory queries are in PowerShell. Um, PowerShell commandlets uh, provide some really advanced, really useful functions. Really, with, with, with relative ease. So, um, you know, here, pardon me. If, if you um, if you're in PowerShell, you just import the Active Directory module, and um, this is basic examples of commandlets that you can use in the Active Directory module. You can get AD user, you can get AD computer, and you can get all kinds of information from there. And if you want more information and more examples on uh, of the different Commands and all of the pretty, pretty, uh, pretty incredible stuff that PowerShell commandlets can do with Active Directory. There's a link there, and I will make this slide deck available after the conference. 
So um, again, here I am. You can see in the top, uh, there's the output of get ad user. You can see still a lot of that same information there about uh, you know, my, my username, um, you know, all that kind of useful stuff. And you can also get ad computer information. So you can, at the bottom, you can see um, the different uh, aspects of uh, you know what, what you can what you can see about uh, a computer object in AD as well. So that's all that's all good. That's all good stuff. Um, this is where we get into um, something that I think is probably a little bit more. Well, I think this is more more advanced and more interesting. Um, AD detection engineering. So. Um, when, you, when you're armed with a good knowledge of Active Directory, uh, you can use that to, uh, to, to build some really quite uh, high fidelity detections in Active Direct in, um, in your sim. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, one uh, being Bloodhound detections and the other being Kerber Roasting. So I'll just show you um, how you can build a pretty high fidelity detection for, for both of those. Just using some, some basic knowledge of Active Directory and you know logs that are readily available. So first of all, Bloodhound attack. So what is Bloodhound? Bloodhound um, is an attacking tool that uh, allows you to enumerate AD objects and uh, attack paths by uh, by just you know, leveraging um, leveraging a privileged user account and and using it to enumerate the Active Directory uh, objects from there. Um, the telltale sign in, uh, in Windows of that attack would be event ID 4662. Um, um, event ID 4662 tells you that an operation was performed on an object, which sounds about as interesting as dishwater. Um, but well, and, and because it is such a such a sort of generic sounding uh, event. It's very noisy because every time an operation is performed on an object in Active Directory, you're getting a 4662. You're, you're getting that. So if you just turn on event ID 4662 and you think, aha, well, I'm going to get these event logs and that's going to tell me if we're having a bloodhound attack, you're going to just get tons and tons and tons of noise and it's just going to like fill up all of your sim storage and it's just going to make your life horrible. Um, so we need to find a way to. Uh, reduce that noise and come up with a high fidelity um, detection that's going to actually tell us when something suspicious is actually going on. Um, so yeah, how do we do that? Um, well, the first step would be to create a Honeypot account. Now, I realize, based on Kat's talk earlier, that I'm probably not using the term Honeypot quite correctly. I think the term that I'm looking for is a honey prep or a Honey Token. But still, the idea is the same. What you're trying to create is uh, you're creating an account in your system that looks incredibly tempting to a, a, a potential attacker. You want to take an account that has history, so either take an, an actual old account and repurpose it, or find some way to make it look as if the account has history. Because if, if you have, you know, like if you have a, a, a an admin account that was created yesterday. Um, an attacker might be a bit leery of that because they'd want to see an account that's actually been used. Um, uh, you need to, yeah, you need to make it really kind of give it um, unique, uh, I don't know why I said STM, because that's, that's more of the cover. You need to give it sort of um, group memberships that make it look very privileged. Uh, so, you know, don't have to use actual privileged uh, security groups, but Give it a security group that looks like it might be like create a group that's that's got no permissions and call it like super admins, and then put the Honeypot account in that group so that it looks like it's an incredibly privileged account. Right? Um, and then limit its login abilities. So it looks like it's an incredibly useful account that an attacker is going to be really tempted by, but make it so that it can't actually do anything. Make it so that it can't log on any hour of the day or night. Or uh, make it only able to log on to a workstation that doesn't really exist. That's a good way to go. Um, and I actually found it quite funny as well. 
Um, but yeah, once you've done that, once you've created your, uh, your honeypot objects, then note down the object GUID, uh, which is going to be somewhere in the attribute editor, right? You're going you're gonna to look through in the attribute editor for that object, you're going to find what the GUID is, and then you can use that information to create a detection within your sim, whether it's you know, Sentinel or Splunk or you know, whatever your, your sim of choice may be, and you can create that detection to alert on 4662 events from that Honeypot account. And what that tells us is that if event 4662 fires and uh, the GUID on that event is the Honeypot account GUID, then we know that someone has used that account to try and perform a Bloodhound attack, which is a pretty sure sign that someone is attacking the environment. So that that's how you can uh, you can use uh, Active Directory to create some pretty pretty high fidelity indicators of an attack. Kind of like it's sort of like a, a rudimentary uh, IDS IPS system. And not only can you do this with Bloodhound, you can do a very similar thing with Kerberos. Um, same kind of technique. You would instead of 4662, you'd uh, use event code 4769. Uh, that 4769 event code tells you a Kerberos service ticket was requested. Again, it's a pretty noisy source. Anytime Kerberos is getting a, 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 a ticket request, which is pretty frequent, you're going to get that event code. So again, we want to find ways to um, get rid of the noise and make a high fidelity alert. So for curb roasting, using a unique honeypot SPN is important. What's an SPN? It's a service principle name. Um, it's kind of akin to an alias for an Active Directory username, um, except it's used uh, specifically for service level authentication. So for Windows services or application services to authenticate to one another, um, they wouldn't use a username, they would use a service principle name. Um, and the important thing when you're creating your Honeypot service principle name is it needs to look like it's highly privileged, but it needs to be something that is, it needs to be like not a real service principle name. You can't be actually using it anywhere in production uh, because otherwise you you are potentially giving the attacker access to, uh, to privileged uh, services. So, for instance, you could create an SPN like AD passwords, or you know, SQL service stuff, or <laughs> well, not that, but you, you could make something look like it's it's a, a really highly privileged system level SPN, uh, but just make sure that you're not actually using a real one. So, then. Armed with that information, you can create the detection to alert on 4769 events from the uh, from that Honeypot account, from that SPN. So what that gives you is, if that fires and the service name in the event log is the, is the SPN from that Honeypot account, then you know, again, someone has used that Honeypot account to perform a curve roasting attack. Um, because you're not using that SPN anywhere in your environment. The only time that would be used would be because somebody has seen that SPN and is trying to leverage it for curve roasting. Does that make sense? Awesome. OK, cool. Um, and again, that creates a high fidelity indicator of an attack. All right. So um, now we're going to go into pop quiz time. So uh, everyone ready? This is the interactive bit. So we're going to have to. You're gonna have to start start thinking. Um, let's say that I receive an alert from, sorry, there's an alert that you have multiple failed VPN logins. I'm gonna go back to my screen here because rather than just like looking at this all the time and not looking at you, I'm gonna stand here. Um, you receive an alert that there's multiple failed VPN logins from the user of Richard Smith. They all come from Rochester, New York, and they all began around 11 a.m. on March 18th, 2023. Um, the environment is using single sign-on for VPN. Um, how can we quickly figure out what might be causing this? Any thoughts? All right. Well, we could run NetUser for 
that Richard Smith user and see what the output is. We could search for the user in Active Directory, navigate to the object tab, and see what the last modified date and time is, so we can see when that account was last modified by looking in AD. Or the other alternative would be using ADAC, which is the, um, it's the newer interface for, uh, the, the newer sort of GUI interface for AD. You can go in, scroll down to extensions, click on attribute editor, and then have a look at the password last set attribute. Any of those would point you to the fact that, ah, this user last set their password at 10.51 a.m., just before the activity started. So if we've got multiple, uh, multiple logon failures starting around 11 a.m. on that day, and the person just reset their password, what's the, like, what, what's the most likely explanation? Forgot their password? Possibly. I'm sorry. It's still logged in somewhere else. Yeah, right, yeah. But most likely it's, it's cache credentials from like either from a phone or from another device that they haven't updated. Yeah, that's, um, and that is honestly from, uh, from, my, from my time working in SOC, it's one of the more common, one of the more common tickets that you see. Um, and again, you can see the same information there in Active Directory and, and there in ADAC as well. But all points to the same information. Okay, so um, let's go on to another one. We have a user named Joe Musashi. Any uh, Shinobi fans? Sega, the old Sega arcade game Shinobi? No, okay, all right, I'm, okay, so that reference is completely lost on everyone, no worries. <laughs> but uh, this user has been added to the restricted security group uh, DB underscore read write. And this group grants full administrative access to the company's SQL databases. How can we determine if uh, that indicates a potential elevation of privilege attack? Is this legit activity or not? What's, what are some ways we could, we could determine that? Uh, yeah? Is there an access request for that particular right? I'm sorry. Is there an access request associated with that right? Oh, like a help desk request? Okay. Let's see. So the, the the way that I was the way that I was going with this was if you look in Active Directory and you go to their uh, go to the organization tab and you note the information that's that's in in the users organization tab in AD, um, you can see their job title, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, same thing in ADAC. You could look for the same information there. Um, however. Right. Not all organizations uh, make use of that tab. Not everyone's going to manually input that information. And if that's the case, if the org doesn't record that information, and if we can't determine through any other means, um, then we need to contact the user's manager to confirm that this is, or you know, we could look, look for a, an existing request in the, in the system. For, uh, you know, th those, are, those are the other ways that you could go about it if you don't have it in Active Directory. And um, that conversation might go a little bit like, um, a little bit like that. Anyway, um, but yeah, so that's, if you look here, we can see this person's a principal database architect, so having full access to the company's databases kind of makes sense. And yeah, there you go. That's my attempt at humor. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at another one. So. Let's say we get an alert that a user account has been set to never expire. Uh, you look in Active Directory, and you can see that the account is currently disabled, and as you look through the history of the account, it looks like it's been disabled ever since it was created. It never was enabled in the first place, as far as you can tell. Um, any possible reasons that we can think of for this situation? It's possible that does happen in some organisations. Yeah, um, well, they they like they'll create the account, but they won't activate it until like the person's first day or something. Yeah, um, I'm going in a different direction with this. Let's see, what kind of account does it sound like based on what we've talked about uh, earlier on? 
and I, I, I may have like skipped. I may have skimmed over this, so this may not have. Uh, I may not have uh, properly explained earlier. Yeah. Hmm? Is it a honey account? Um, it could be, but um, there's perfectly legitimate um, reasons why this kind of account would exist in the system as well. Um, are there any types of accounts or user objects in Active Directory that don't ever actually sign in? A conference room, yeah. Let's say, I mean, it's a Microsoft Exchange mailbox, is what it comes down to. It really, it's just a, it's a resource object of some kind. It could be, um, yeah, a conference room or like a resource account of some kind or another. Um, Okay, yeah, so this is the same thing. I'm just giving more information. Okay. Um, so, yeah, resource accounts are created through Microsoft Exchange. Um, they are immediately disabled. The password never expires, and the user cannot change the password because the, the password is actually never used. The account is never actually logged into. It's just there as a kind of placeholder object in AD, but it's really an exchange object um, uh, that's just used like a mailbox, um, but it's not actually logged into it as an AD account, which is why it's disabled. Um, so, so yeah, so when, when you see a, a situation like that, um, that is the most likely explanation for what you're seeing. Okay, so um, that is that is uh, that is my talk. So, in conclusion, um, Active Directory is our friend. Uh, it has a ton of information about users, computers, networks, etc. that you can find really with just a little digging. Um, it's, it, it, it's, all, it's all right there. It just needs a little bit of digging to find information. Um, many of the, the most common uh, alerts and uh, incidents that you find in a security operations center can be worked end to end just with simple AD tools. Um, so no need, in most cases, no need to escalate. It's, it's just if you, if you know how to, how to use uh, you know, simple active directory tools, uh, you can work these alerts end to end and do full investigations. Um, and yeah, active directory logs can be leveraged to engineer some really high quality, high fidelity detections in your SIM. And finally, knowledge is power. So um, uh, if you, gain some expertise in Active Directory, it's going to make you really stand out from the crowd in, uh, in a SOC environment, and uh, it'll be a very good thing for your InfoSec career. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. So um, I have some time. So any questions from anybody about any of that? I stunned you all over the silence. It's amazing. I just did such an awesome job. Okay, well, if, um, if anyone wants to grab me afterwards, I'm, I'm here for the rest of the day. Um, happy to talk about anything and nothing and everything. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, folks, and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks.